to be clean, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. Now watch this. A what? A new heart also will I give you. You're not working for it. You're not going to uh, contrive and, and make and create this thing. Listen, your part is to think no evil. Your part is to police your thoughts. Your part, your warfare, is to guard what you're thinking. Because this is how you are saved or lost, is through corrupt or pure thoughts. One, of the, one way or the other, you're either going up or you're going down. And there's two voices that we're listening to all day long. He says, and I will. Who will? Wesley's not part of that equation. I'm not part of this act. But this is the reward. This is, the, this is what our Savior wants to do for us. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. So when, listen, this is righteousness by faith. Listen carefully to what's being said here. Your part is to resist those thoughts. Okay, let's go to James 4. James chapter 4. I believe it is. James. Let me verify that. Father, make sure I'm going to the right place here. Okay, thank you. James chapter 1, my apologies. Verse 12. So we have a work to do. This is true. It's two parts. Do you know what they are? Based on our discussions in the last two days, what are the two parts that we have that we have to do? Number one, we have to do what? We have to police our thoughts. We have to refuse the evil and accept the good. Our thoughts, moment by moment, are going to dictate what character we have. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So who are you? Who am I? What are we thinking? We have to police our thoughts. That's the first part. We have to res which is resisting the enemy. But before we resist, what are we supposed to do? Submit ourselves to God. Then we resist the devil and the promise comes, he will flee. He will flee. Why does he flee? Because he's darkness, God is light, and what company had light with darkness? You see, when Jesus comes on board and he's working on giving you a new heart through his spirit, there is no darkness that can be there in that. But the moment we start thinking evil... The moment we start allowing these thoughts to come into our Christian experience, Sister White tells us that every impure thought obliterates the impressions of the Holy Spirit. Wow. Do you see why Satan is so successful? Do you see why your best intentions are falling flat on their face? Because we don't understand the warfare we're in. Yes, it's a spiritual warfare. But it all comes down to a decision. You and I have to choose. Remember what we began yesterday. We have to choose. All right, so we've got that part done. Now what's the next part that has to be done? What is our part from that point forward? Jesus says, I will put a new heart within you. What do we have to do with that? Friends, we have to believe that. Righteousness. By faith. By faith. Do you believe that your cultivated tendencies to evil, things you have cultivated, that you have willingly done, knowing it was wrong, or maybe you didn't know it was wrong, your cultivated tendencies to evil, your hereditary traits, you know, the things that your mother, your father, your grandparents passed on to you that are like a prison to you in your character traits. Jesus is saying, I can write a new heart in you. I can put a new heart in there. Just choose me. Just choose me. And believe. Do you believe me? Here in verse 12 of, of James chapter 1. Blessed is the man 
that endureth temptation. How do you endure temptation? You keep choosing the right. You think you could be tempted once? You think you could be just tempted twice? Then it's all over? We have to be tempted until our heart says, no way. No way. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Now, we're going to transition now into some, what I would say are explicit details of how temptation occurs. How the enemy comes and recommends things to us that bring about our demise, moment by moment. So let's notice what's happening. You see, if you understand better the transaction that's occurring that leads to your fall, then if you see the way marks, then you might be able to say at that point, no, I know what's going on now. No, sir. I rebuke you, Satan. I am not thinking those thoughts. That's what my experience was. Verse 13, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Now watch. But every man, how many? Every man. every man is tempted. Is it a sin to be tempted? No. Was Jesus tempted? Okay, so let's have that right framework. But every man is tempted <clears throat> when he is drawn away of his own lust. Are there, is there more than one tempted? There's the act of tempting, and so therefore you are tempted by that act and this, is, this may sound like I'm splitting hairs, but you need to understand this. Was Jesus drawn away of his own lust? That's what it says the tempted is, but we know the Bible also says he was tempted, right? So there has to be two, two forms of tempting, or two concepts surrounding tempted. So let's consider them. I am tempted, let's just say, I had a banana split yesterday evening, but let's just say I'm tempted to go down and get another one. In this respect, I'm being maybe drawn away of my own lusts. I might have a craving for that. I might like that. I might want that. Satan knows that, and he lays the temptation to draw you out of the narrow way. But he may, by the same token, come to you with the very same thing and say, Hey, wouldn't you love to have that banana split? Remember how nice and cold it was and the strawberry sauce and all that was on it? He's tempting me but I'm not tempted. Do you understand? Yet I am being tempted. Did I lose you? So I'm being tempted. The act of tempting is being accomplished by the enemy. Okay, he's tempting. Whether I'm tempted or not depends upon this definition. Am I drawn away of my own lusts? That's, that's what it's all about. And this is why Jesus told the men his disciples, the enemy cometh, and he hath what? Nothing. Nothing in me. There's no lust for the things of the world in me. There's no craving for the things of this world. Where is our treasure, friends? That's where our heart should be, in Christ. In Christ is heaven, Sister White says. So if our thoughts are guarded, if we're not longing for the things of this world, if we're not allowing our minds to dwell on, boy, it would sure be nice if I had one of those. You see, it's so subtle. We need to be very guarded and in that very prayerful because it's through the smallest little thoughts that come that we're led astray. But you know what? The opposite is true too. If we are guarding every little small thought and implanting or supplanting good thoughts, thinking no evil of anyone, not jumping to conclusions about what your spouse meant or what they're saying or, or your children or, or whatever it may be. The Bible says to be slow to speak, quick, slow to speak, slow to wrath, and quick to hear. And this is good counsel for us. Look at the definition with me now. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. Sorry, verse 14. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. You see the bait? You see the hook in the, on, on the bobber there in the water? The fish is being tempted to eat the worm. When, then when lust, lust is our desire for something, then when lust hath conceived. Now we, 
we as adults, we understand conception in the, in the realm of the birthing of children and so forth. We understand that the woman's egg and the man's sperm have to meet. And then what happens? Conception. Life. Right? So let's consider that as conception. And it says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. So here it is. Satan comes to you with his voice. The Spirit of God is there too. They're striving for the throne of your heart. So when the temptation is coming, he's hoping that you will bite the hook, that sin will have conceived. You see, you can recommend all to, that you want to me, the most insidious, vile things, Satan, but I have to accept it. I have to, to set aside my freedom of choice and choose to think that. He can't force himself on us, make us continue to think. But when we dwell on things that are unholy, by beholding we become changed. So you're being tempted. Friends, you haven't sinned yet until you say, yeah, yeah. Then, you, then it's conceived and it's your sin now. And praise the Lord, we have an advocate with the Father. But it need not be so. If we're going to be overcomers, we have to start now. Baby steps. So, when we're talking about overcoming in this verse, in these verses, we want to understand what's actually happening in this transaction. You are going to be tempted to say something, go somewhere, do something that Christ would not approve of. And that the Spirit of God, I pray, is still able to get His thoughts across to you saying, don't do that. That's not right. Have you been there? Have you stood at the crossroads and you heard both voices and you made the wrong choice? I have. I'm not proud of that, but I have. And I swa this is why I thank God for this understanding. And again, I'm just scratching the surface this week. But please go study this out. Because see, this is the science of salvation that, that we can relate to at a practical, personal, daily level. If you want to overcome, you have to overcome the things you think. You have to begin to truly start scrutinizing everything your mind is thinking. You ever sat and listened to someone who was talking? And if it's me, don't admit it. But all of a sudden you have bad thoughts about them. Oh, they think they're all that. Look at how they're, man, that's, that's the enemy. That person may have something wonderful to share because he's been studying. He knows the notes he's going to bring before you. But friends, this is nonstop from a thousand different directions all day. And all we can do is start training our minds to dwell upon that which is holy, pure, just, and true. And listen, do you realize what you're doing? You will create an atmosphere where the principles of heaven can thrive. And you will have barred the way to the enemy. He can't get in now. He hath nothing in you is the goal. Now, I'm not saying, I'm careful to identify something as that narrow way. But let's face it, we know this. We know that salvation is won or lost through the mind that we develop. If we develop a mind that has a flavor for the things of this world, then God says, the love of God is not in him. We have to guard our thoughts, the things we long for, the things we would like to have, the places we'd like to go, the things we'd like to do, the people we'd like to become. And we need to be focused. Jesus wants us to learn his voice. Through the agency of the Holy Spirit, every day since you've been here and beyond, the Spirit of God has been striving with you and I, calling to us. Is there anybody here that has not had some challenges this week? Okay, no hands went up, good. Good meaning God is trying to develop our character. You're going to meet the trials. But what a joy it is, friends, to know that Jesus is there. When we are in trial and we are in the middle of things that seem to just want to overcome us, just roll right over us like a wave at the beach, 
Jesus says, I will be at your right hand and I will uphold thee with my righteous right hand. The thoughts that we want to think, we can think. And even though when you leave here, you realize that the enemy has doubled or tripled his thoughts against you. That's okay. It doesn't change the rule. Reject them. You just have more to reject. But over time, you will, I promise you, you will see a difference in the way that you think and, as a result, the way that you react to those things that used to just take, get your goat. It used to push your buttons. You'll have more patience with your family. I'm telling you, these things will come because he's promised to put a new heart and a new mind within us. So there's two spirits. Let me read this to you from Mind, Character, and Personality, page 23, paragraph 3. This is powerful. 1 MCP 23.3. The influence of mind on mind. You realize that's what Satan's doing. But God is too. And it's okay. But we've got to be aware of the warfare. It isn't just about, well, I'm going I'm, I'm to do right today. I'm going to guard. I know I fall in that area, so I'm going to try to stay away from that area. Friends, that's not overcoming. Overcoming is like David. You meet it head on, and you put the rock right between its eyes, and you keep on walking. Amen. There's the army behind him. Go for the army too. How many stones did he have? Five. How many was he prepared for? Five. Okay, so... We have to understand the warfare. Are you getting the picture? The warfare is your mind. That's where deception occurs. That's where faith occurs. So as we're marching forward, as we're rejecting the thoughts that are impure, audibly if you have to, certainly, believe that Jesus at the same time is placing, is writing, is placing a new heart within you. It's happening, friends. The influence of mind upon mind, so strong a power for good when sanctified, is equally strong for evil, equally strong, friends, in the hands of those opposed to God. This power Satan used in his work of instilling evil into the minds of the angels. So now you know what he did in heaven. We're made a little lower than the angels. And he took a third, at one point half, and he convinced them to think evil of the Father. Now, come on. Where are we? 6,000, 7,000 years later. We've got to guard our thoughts. We've got to understand his devices. The power of Satan used in his work of instilling, sorry, this power of Satan used in his work of instilling evil into the minds of the angels. And he made it appear that he was seeking the good of the universe. <clears throat> As the anointed cherub Lucifer had been highly exalted, he was greatly loved by the heavenly beings and his influence over them was strong. Many of them listened to his suggestions and believed his words. What did they do wrong? Listen. They listened. Friends, don't listen. When the, see, this is the beautiful part that I've recognized. Now, you're going, to have to, you're going to have to take this journey yourself. But the moment that the evil thought was coming, the Spirit was telling me, He was interpreting what's coming in. He was, he was cutting it off and showing me, see how that's evil? Right there is why that's evil. And I would stop thinking. I would rebuke it. I would verbally begin to speak because I can't think His thoughts while I'm talking. That's a lesson for us that when others are talking, we should be listening and not be ready to be talking. That was a side note. But the point is, is that when, that when that communication is coming from the enemy, the Spirit is going to be right there to let you know that it's who it is, who it is that you're listening to. And our, our, our part is to re resist, to reject it. Many of them listened to his suggestions and believed his words, quote, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was there a place found anymore in heaven. You see... This, we're, this thing we're talking about, this is mind upon mind. And this was so successful for Satan that he drew initially a, half of the angels into his camp. Ultimately, in the end, it was only a third, but still, a third of what? And where are we in all of this? What power do we feel like we have? We're waging war against principalities and powers. God says he wants to give us a new heart. 
Sec uh, Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 2, page 670, paragraph 3. The words, a new heart, now listen, listen to this definition. The words, a new heart also will I give you, mean a new mind will I give you. You see, when the Bible says, let this mind be in you, it's also saying, let this heart be in you. And we're going to discuss in our next part the difference between the two. What is our count? By the way, I didn't set my timer. I apologize. Okay, good. As the anointed cherub, let's we read that. Okay, so a new mind will I give you is what it means. A new heart is to say I'll give you a new mind. This change of heart is always attended by a clear conception of Christian duty and an understanding of truth. The clearness of our view of truth will be proportionate to our understanding of the Word of God. The point being that to receive a new heart is to receive a new mind. Okay? That's what we want, friends. When he says in Ezekiel 36, 27, I will place a new heart within you, I'm going to give you a new mind. That's what he's telling us. And it's going to come. What's going to keep it from coming? Let's say you resist. You keep telling the enemy no. What's the second part? It's faith. And it's not faith in yourself. It's faith in God's Word. It's faith that He is going to change your desires. He's going to work in you to will and to do of His good pleasure. You're going to have different desires. You're going to have different motives for what you do. You know, Sister White talks about how we can have heaven on this side of His coming. Do you know what she defines heaven as? I think Wes shared that, stated that the other day. What is it? The presence of Christ, of Jesus. And who is it that's with us till the very end? You see, friends, to not only have the mind of Christ is to have heaven. And what is heaven like? I don't know. But what I've experienced in yielding to the leading of the Spirit concerning my thoughts, I've known about this for probably 12 years to my discredit, but I've just recently been led into a much deeper understanding and application of this principle. You see, friends, if we're not guarding our thoughts, if you're not going to take this serious, you will be constantly overthrown. I want to challenge you and those that would watch this material later. Begin to pay close attention. Just, just take the first hour of the morning. Just that hour. Start there. And refuse to think anything that Christ wouldn't approve of. And watch what kind of thoughts come. And you know what? The enemy sitting here now, he knows that others are going to hear this, but he is so successful at it, he's not really concerned about it. <clears throat> and I'm telling you that we are being given warning now. If we are overthrown, this will come back against you in the judgment. You will be reminded that you were warned, that I was warned. If I don't start policing my thoughts and being careful about what I'm thinking, very careful, then I'm going to be led like sheep to the slaughter. One thought connected with another thought connected with another. It's like that slippery slope, friends. But the first thought is what gets you. If you don't stop it there, you're already heading on a different path. You're already making your way out. Okay. I want to convey this last part, and I want to close with this theme of thought. Let me read to you this quote from the devotional Be Like Jesus, page 167, paragraph 2. This paragraph says, The ethics inculcated by the gospel acknowledge no standard but the perfection of God's mind, God's will. Did you catch that? As Pastor Chapman would say, did you catch that? God's mind is what? God's will. Read it again. The ethics inculcated by the gospel acknowledge no standard but the perfection of God's mind. The perfection of God's mind, comma, God's will. Now, when you take the word will in the Bible and you supplant it with mind, give me some scriptures real quick. 
where we're ta it talks about the will of God. Now you're on the word mind. Look at the word will. Where do we see the word will in the Bible? Just anything come to mind? Let's look at Jesus. What did Jesus say? Did he come to do his will? Not my mind, but your mind, Father. Well, what is that telling us? Now, now we're linguistically or liter literally correct there in doing this. We're not out of bounds, but what is it teaching us when we do that? When Jesus says, not my mind, but your mind, because the mind of the Father is His will. It's, they're one and the same. So what is that telling us about ourselves? When we're in that situation, and we want to say differently, not your mind, but my mind. We're saying, I want to abide by my standards. Because also, Spirit of Prophecy will tell us that God's will is His law. So if it really comes down to it. What we're saying is, um, Father, not your rules, but I want to live by my own. I don't want your mind. I want my mind. I like my mind. That's what we're saying, even if we're not consciously making that decision. Not my will, but thy will be done. And here's the point. To have the mind of Christ, to have the mind that God wants us to have, is to have his will, his law. There it is, written in our hearts. So let this mind be in you, ultimately is saying, let me write my law upon your heart. That's what it is. And it comes one thought resisted at a time. That one resisted, this one accepted. That's the warfare. Try it, friends. Try it. Take the first hour. Take the next hour. And watch what you think. Somebody's nearby, they're talking. And you're not even part of the conversation, but Satan starts recommending things to you. It's foolishness. It's mean. It's evil. And don't always accept that that's what you're thinking because this is the work of the enemy. This is his number one highway that he travels to overthrow you and I and the saints. Tomorrow we're going to take up as a man thinketh in his heart will be our next part. So for now, if you'll join me as we seek our Father in prayer. <clears throat> Father, I want to overcome. And even though I've stood before my brothers and sisters tonight, this evening, and I've stated these things, and I, and I, and I get it, I think, I know that the thoughts will still come, and I still have to war. And he is so subtle, Father. I pray especially for my brothers and sisters that are not only here before me, that are here in this camp and those that would hear this material later, that you would be able, Jesus, to impress upon their hearts the seriousness of even the smallest deviation in thought from your will, from your character. Love thinketh no evil, Father. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would reign upon the throne of our hearts. And that we would not think these things, that we would resist the evil and accept that which is good. Please, loving Father, we thank you so much for this counsel. We thank you so much for your word. And also, and just as importantly, Father, let us remember that we have to believe, as we're resisting, that you are writing your law upon the tables of our hearts. Oh, thank you so much, Jesus. Father in heaven, thank you for this blessed day of life a day of choices, a day that we may work. For we pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.